Hello, uh, welcome to the Bay Area Book Festival. Uh, my name is Ian Lendler, and I am here today because I am a picture book writer, and I've just recently written a book. It came out uh, the same week that everyone's school got shut down, um, so not a lot of people have seen it, actually. So this might be the first time you've seen this. Um, it's called The Fabled Life of Aesop, um, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about it, um, but first, I'd just like to tell you about myself in general, because you might not know anything about me. Um, so I write picture books for a living. Um, I write graphic novels. I write lots of books. Um, and one of my favorite things to talk about when I go to schools and I go around the country and talk to kids is what I like to read when I was a kid. Um, and so I'd like to show you that right now, actually, because this was, I, I was a big bookworm when I was a kid. Um, and more than anything, what I really liked to read was this. Um, I was a huge comic book nerd, like like huge. Um, I read comic books all the time. Um, you can see these were actually my favorites, Avengers and X-Men. Um, in case you're wondering, my favorite Avenger was probably Hawkeye. Um, and my favorite X-Men was Wolverine. Um, but so anyways, so I loved superheroes and I read about them all the time. But something happened as I got around middle school, maybe high school, which is that I actually kind of started to get bored with superheroes. <laughs> <clears throat> and, and that's not such a strange thing because superhero comics were all you had when I was a kid. There was no such thing as a comic book that wasn't a superhero. Um, and like the movies are great. I watch all the movies, but nowadays something happened after like when I graduated high school between then and when I started being a writer in my twenties um, and something big happened to comic books, which is they sort of got relabeled as graphic novels. And they became this. Let's see if I can show it to you. Oh, there we go. Like this, Walking Dead. Walking Dead did not exist when I was a kid. A, a comic book about zombies, right? And like comic books can suddenly be about anything now that they're called graphic novels. Like this, um, the Zeus series, the Olympian series about Zeus. This is a great one. If you can read this, find out your library something by George O'Connor. Fantastic series. Um, Persepolis, this is one of my favorite books of all time, actually. Um, it's about a little girl growing up in the country of Iran um, during a revolution that they had. And it turns out it wasn't such a great place to grow up in at the time. Um, and then Adventure Time. Actually, one of my picture books called One Day a Dot, um, I was fortunate enough to work with Shelley Perlene and Braden Lamb, who are two of the illustrators for Adventure Time. And so I got to talk to them about Adventure Time. I love that show. Um, and it was really, it was really just nice talking to them and having them explain some of the stuff to me, which I still don't understand everything that goes on that show, but there you go. So anyways, what I'm saying is comic books got really, really exciting. And I really got back into comic books as I got older, um, graphic novels, because now you have things like sisters and drama and smile and the Olympian series. And I just got really excited again about telling stories with pictures in them. And I got so excited that I kind of came up with my own idea. Um, and this was my idea, which was uh, I, a zookeeper is locking up her zoo for the night. And the anteater, you can see the anteater right there, sticks out its tongue and snags the keys from the zookeeper and lets all the other animals out of their cages. Um, and when they're all out, I was trying to think of what they could do. Like all the animals in the zoo get out. And I thought it'd be really cool if they put on a performance of some kind. Uh, so I thought the best play that they could put on would be what's considered one of the greatest plays of all time, which is Macbeth. And so I called my series, The Stratford Zoo Midnight Review Presents Macbeth. And Macbeth, I had a little help in writing it from my co-writer, this guy, William Shakespeare, um, usually sort of considered one of the great writers of all time. And I really enjoyed that experience and the book did well. And so my, I was fortunate enough that my publisher asked me to do a second one, the Stratford Zoo Midnight Review Presents Romeo and Juliet. And there have been tons of Romeo and Juliet's done all through the ages. Romeo and Juliet is a thousands year old story. Uh, but, you know, by doing it with animals, it was something a little bit different and it was fun. Uh, so uh, what was interesting about this was a classic story like Romeo and Juliet or a classic story like Macbeth. Everyone's seen a zillion times, but if you do it with animals, it's kind of fun and interesting. And it really got me sort of 
thinking about that idea in general, which is, you know, everybody, we all read picture books with animals in them. Um, and there's a lot of really famous talking animals in the world like this. You all know who this is. Say it along with me. It's the cat in the hat, right? And this, this is Paddington. It's like one of the best movies ever made. And Bugs Bunny and Scooby-Doo and Winnie the Pooh and Garfield and also basically every Disney movie ever made. And at that point, I actually started to get really interested after I had already written my strap for zoo books in where all these talking animals come from. I mean, you know, it, it sounds dumb, but in our culture, we're just used to the idea that animals talk and they tell stories and we tell stories with them. And so I kind of wanted to find out where it came from. Um, now, I was a huge, huge, huge um, children's book fan uh, when I was a kid and growing up. And I read all the fairy tales I ever could, like uh, the Brothers Grimm and Hans Christian Andersen, like The Little Mermaid, um, and um, fables as well, <clears throat> like Aesop's fables. And now, a lot of you may have heard of those. Some of you may have not. But there are a lot of really, really famous Aesop's fables like this, The Lion and the Mouse, or The Boy Who Cried Wolf or the goose that laid the golden egg, or the story of the tortoise and the hare. Um, that's an Aesop fable. There are tons and tons of Aesop fables that we all know about in our culture, um, and we don't think about it too much. But those have been around for a long time, and so I started to get really interested in it, because it's not fables that were always told and read by our parents. It's Aesop's fables. And obviously, because I'm a writer, I got interested in, wait, who was Aesop? I have no idea. I've been reading these things my whole life and had them read to me my whole life. And I never once thought about this guy, Aesop, that everybody knows. Because his fables are everywhere, by the way. Um, there are fables, in, Aesop fables told in Spanish. There are Aesop fables translated into Swahili. There are Aesop fables, this is the ant and the grasshopper, um, translated, this is Japanese. Right? This one is in Chinese. And that's the story of the tiger and the crane. You can see them right there. Um, and it turns out Aesop's fables, and this is a true fact, have been translated into as many languages around the world as the Bible. And not only that, but Aesop's fables um, have been illustrated more times than any other book on the planet, including the Bible. Aesop's fables, it turns out, are very, very, very old. So I got even more interested. So I just kept reading about it. Um, in fact, how old are they? Well, so this is the story of the fox and the crane right here, right? Uh, the tiger and the crane. This is the king of France, Louis the Sixteenth. He had a garden made up, a very, very fancy garden in Versailles, his palace. And this was a statue in his garden. This is the story of the, of the tiger and the fox and the crane, right? He had a whole garden made out just of Aesop's fables, but it actually gets older than that. So see this? You can see there the crane and the fox there. This um, wall was carved out of stone in the 13th century, right? So that's 700 years old right there. And it turns out, if you follow Aesop's fables all the way back to their very origins, they started here, ancient Greece. Now, a lot of you may have heard of ancient Greece, and we kind of think of it like this, you know, like big columns and ruins in Greece. Um, and even more, we may think about like this. And when we think of Greece, we think of the Greek gods because they're some of the coolest stories ever. And this, the Olympian series written by George O'Connor. He's a good friend of mine. Um, they're just awesome. So if you can find a way to read them right now, uh, while we're in quarantine, please do. Um, and so anyways, ancient Greece was around for a long period of time. Uh, this was BC before Christ. Um, and this particular time period was like seven or 600 BC. Okay. And it turns out that ancient Greece was famous for a lot of things. It was famous for they invented theater. They had the Greek gods. They were in the invention of democracy. Um, lots of things like that. And they were the inventors of fables. And more importantly, this guy, see this statue, this is thought to be a representation of Aesop. Now, it's important to say nobody quite knows what Aesop looked like because this was so long ago. Um, but they think this might have been what he looked like. And this. So when the printing press was first invented to make books like this, to print books on paper, you know, as opposed to writing them by hand, which is what they used to do, the first book they ever printed was the Bible. The second book, the first illustrated book that they printed where they put pictures with it, 
was a book of Aesop's fables. And it was a story about the life of Aesop. And this was from that first book, right? This is what they thought Aesop might have looked like. He was famous for being incredibly ugly. Um, one writer referred to him, to him as looking like a galloping pig, which apparently is the ugliest form of pig. Um, another one referred to him as a toolbox, apparently not a good looking toolbox. And another one said he simply looked like a group of monkeys put together. Um, but so this is Aesop and there's more about the Aesop story. So I started to get really interested in reading about it. There's more to the Aesop story, which is that he was a slave, right? And this is sort of one of the older depictions of Aesop. And you can see he's serving a master there. Um, because when, again, whenever we think about ancient Greece, <clears throat> again, we think of Greek columns and buildings that are in ruins. And we think of statues like this. And there are a lot of statues that look like this, you know, sort of a, Greek woman looking very fancy with her fancy dress and her fancy headdress being served by someone that's a little girl right there. Um, but here's the thing. That was actually a slave. Um, Greek society is famous for a lot of things. They invented democracy, theater, as I said, but about 25% of the population of Greece were enslaved people, right? Um, and Aesop was one of them. So you have a lot of statues that look like this, kind of a happy domestic scene. But there was a darker side to Greece, which is that it actually looked like this as well. This is taken from another statue depiction on the side of a tomb, actually. And you can see that man in chains right there. Um, you can see there's a choke collar around his neck and in chains. It's not quite as happy a depiction as this, right? So ancient Greece had a very, very, very dark side to it. And it turns out the story of Aesop, Aesop the writer, not just the fables themselves, but Aesop himself it is the dark side of ancient Greece. And it tells the story of where all these fables come from. Um, and so I turned that into a book. Now, this is a very old story. This story is about 2,500 years old, the story of Aesop. And I should stress, nobody actually knows if it's true or not is the thing. But we know that the fables are, are there because we read them to our kids every day. We get them read to us. And we know that this story, I did not make any of this story up. We know that this story is true too. And so a lot of historians think that maybe this story was something that um, enslaved people told themselves to help them get through their lives while they're struggling in Greece. And you'll find out soon in a second. Um, now, I have to say, I'm a writer. And so when I come and do video things like this, or I go to talk to schools, um, they ask me to talk about everything I know, which is fine, but I'm not a talker, I'm not a politician, I'm not a teacher really. So I'm not as good at talking as I am as writing things down on the page when I get to sit and think about it and consider what I do. So rather than hear me go blah, blah, blah for a while, I thought maybe it'd be better if I could just read the story to you and you could mm, get a better sense of what the story of Aesop is actually life. Like, um, now this is actually one of the longer picture books I've ever done. Um, and so I'm going to give you the short version of it right now. Um, the actual book is about 64, 65 pages long, but I'm going to do the short version. Um, and so it's written by me, but as you can see from this cover picture here, it is a beautiful book. This is probably the prettiest book I've ever um, been involved in. And it's illustrated by Pamela Zagorensky, who is an amazing illustrator. Um, and before I start reading the book, I'd just like to say that she would have loved to have been here today to talk about it because she's a really fascinating artist. And I'd like to point out some of the stuff she did in the book, little hidden details as we go. But she couldn't be here today because of the reason that we're all here today. We're all on video cameras because of the coronavirus. We're all having quarantine. And unfortunately, she got sick as well with what she believes to be the coronavirus. Um, so she'd really like to be here today, but she couldn't. But it's actually a good caution as well for all of us to be careful, um, to stay with our families, to social distance, to do all the things that can help because it, it's out there. Um, and so anyways, let me start reading the story and we can talk about it as we go. So one day, a slave was born. It was sometime around 2005 years ago in somewhere near Greece. No one knows for sure because the baby's parents were slaves too. No one recorded the history of enslaved people. 
so no one knows their names. The only thing we know is the name they gave their baby boy, which was Aesop. Now, Aesop was taken from his parents and sent to work in the great fields of Samos, which was a hot, dry island in the Mediterranean Sea. And again, remember, I'm not making this part up. This is all part of the story that's been told for thousands and thousands of years. Now, growing up, Aesop learned to speak differently from people who were free. Slaves, no matter where they are in the world, no matter what time in history they are, have to be careful what they say. So one day out in the field, a slave said to Aesop, I heard the master has smelly feet, but the master overheard, and that person was never seen again. So slaves learned to tell stories in ways that won't get them in trouble. They spoke about the animals and the natural world around them. The next day in the field, the person working next to Aesop said, did you hear the story about the lion? He stepped on a thorn and his paw got infected. Oh, said Aesop. So that's why his paw smells. See, Aesop had learned to speak in code. And so all the stories that we have, I'm just going to go off the story from all the stories that we have about talking animals and things like that, they all come from this, which is the fact that slaves were out working in nature like this all day long, you know, and they, they had no TVs, they had no computers. So they were surrounded by nature. They were surrounded by animals talking back and forth to each other. And so this was their reference point. And so when they had to speak in code to avoid being caught, their way of t speaking was to sort of translate what they thought the animals might be said. Everyone soon noticed there was something special about Aesop. For instance, one day the water in the well dropped so low that the bucket couldn't reach and no one knew what to do. But Aesop had an idea. And you can see that Pamela put the crow in here flying and dropping stones in the water. And that's a very famous Aesop's fable called The Crow in the Pitcher, which you may have heard about, <clears throat> where the crow can't reach into the pitcher to get a drink. So he drops stones in to raise the level of the water high enough for him to drink. And so this is where I believe that a lot of Aesop's fables came from, right? Which is clever ideas that enslaved people came up with to get through their day. Everyone thought this idea was so clever, they all pitched in to help. And the water began to rise. You can see all the enslaved people there dropping the stones into the water. And when it reached the top, <clears throat> their cheers drew the attention of Aesop's master, Xanthus. Now, Xanthus decided to test Aesop. He said, you're clever enough to help slaves, but are you clever enough to help me? At this point, Aesop hesitated. He was scared. He had to find a way to tell the truth without angering his master. He had to speak in code. So Aesop said, One day, a mouse accidentally stepped on a sleeping lion. And you may rec recognize this as one of the more famous fables. The lion woke up and grabbed the mouse. Let me go, begged the mouse. Someday I'll repay you. The lion laughed at the idea of a puny mouse helping him. But he let the mouse go. The next day, the lion got trapped in a hunter's net. And he roared helplessly. The mouse came running, and he gnawed at the net until it broke, and the lion was free. You see, said the mouse, even a mouse can help a mighty lion. Now, this is one of Aesop's more famous fables, but if you put it in the con this context, which is Aesop is an enslaved person having to deal with a master, you can see that the fable means something very, very different than what we think about when our parents put us to bed at night and read us a simple story. <clears throat> When Aesop finished his story, Xanthus laughed and said, very clever indeed. Come work in my house, little mouse, and you can chew on any nets that trap me. Now here I'm going to skip over a little part of the story, because I said the story is actually very interesting and a bit longer, but I want to give you the short version for today. In the home, Aesop went to work, and for every problem his master faced, Aesop created a story about sly foxes, foolish farmers, or clever mice. The stories warned against greed and deceit. They taught the value of working hard and being honest, humble, and kind. But many of them taught another hidden lesson as well. Just as the story of the lion and the mouse told a second story, if we view it from the point of view of an enslaved person. These hidden lessons were something no master would pick up on. And now inside the book, 
if I can show you the book for a moment. So inside the book, we have the story of Aesop's fables as I just read it. But inside the book, there's a second book. And that is a book of just Aesop's fables by themselves, some of which you may know, right? For instance, there's the story of the tortoise and the hare, right? And Pamela did these in a totally different style, right? The paper, pages are a lot shinier. There's the story of the boy who cried wolf. See, these are some of the more famous ones. And I'd actually like to tell you a story that I really love, which is not quite as well known. I'd like to show you a little bit um, how the artist works. And she's going to be here to tell us herself, but I have some of the rough drafts. Now, this is the really, really cool part about being a picture book writer, um, which is that you get to see an artist at work and you get to see how they work through their ideas. Um, and so I have a few of her rough drafts right here. The story of the North Wind and the Sun, I'll tell you in just in a moment, but it's about a contest between the North Wind and the Sun. And so here's Pamela's idea, rough idea, of what the North Wind might look like. It blows its breeze at the person down there. And if you take an artist like Pamela and give her enough time and enough hours, and she said it takes many, many, many hours for each one of these pages to come through, here's what a second draft would look like. Right. I just, I find that amazing. So from this rough idea to this, and you can see how much more detail, how many more, how many more layers she adds. So that's the North wind. But if you want to see the sun, look at this. This is one of my favorite images, right? The sun reaching out to help this person and to shine on them. And so, the, but this is just the rough draft. See, I was fine with her stopping at this because I can't draw a stick person. And I thought this was so lovely that she should just stop there, but she kept going. And it turned into this. And that's the sun. And now I could read this to you straight because I do love this story. But I actually did a reading once and Pamela took the images that we had for the book and she actually animated them. And I would love to show you what they look like right now. And so I'm going to show you a brief little one minute movie that we made of the north wind and the sun. The North Wind and the Sun by Aesop The North Wind and the Sun were trying to decide who was more powerful. When they saw a traveler walking down the road, the Sun said, Let's have a contest. Whoever can remove that man's coat is the winner. Oh, that's easy, said the North Wind. And he began to blow. He tore at the man's coat with powerful, icy blasts. <sighs> but the traveler only wrapped his coat tighter around himself. The north wind gave up, exhausted. It's impossible, he said. Then it was the sun's turn, and she began to shine. The air turned lovely and warm. The traveler unbuttoned his coat. Soon, the traveler decided to enjoy the sunny day. So he lay down in the shade of a tree and took off his coat. And the moral is, people respond better to kindness than to force. I have to say, I absolutely love that little movie. Pamela added the, um, the music to it. Um, although I did do the blowing all myself, that's authentic author blowing. Um, but so anyways, there's a whole bunch of fables. I believe there's 10 or 12 of the fables inside the book itself. Um, and so hopefully you'll get a chance to read some of those. And again, even you don't have to read my book, um, somewhere in your house, I hope knock on, knock on wood, somewhere in your house is a book of Aesop's fables somewhere. And hopefully you can go and read those and think about Aesop's life and it will change how you think about some of these fables. So now after that, we get back to Aesop's story itself. Again, this part I haven't actually made up. This is part of the 2,500-year-old story. With the help of Aesop's stories, his master became a successful and well-respected man, not just in business, but in life. He became a wiser and more generous person. He learned to treat others with respect. And one day he said to Aesop, I would like to reward you for your service. Ask me for anything, Aesop, and I will grant your wish. And this time, Aesop did not hesitate. He told a story he'd probably wanted to tell his entire life. 
Now here, I don't know what story Aesop told him, but I know this is one of Aesop's fables. And it seems so perfect and so exact. I can't imagine that this wasn't a story that was running through a lot of enslaved people's heads when they told the story of Aesop himself. One day, a wolf was weak with hunger. A house dog saw the wolf and said, cousin, you'll die in the wild. Come work for my master. He'll feed you every day. The wolf was so hungry, he agreed and followed the dog home. As they walked, the wolf noticed the fur on the dog's neck was worn away. So you can see the little band around the dog's neck there. Oh, that's nothing, said the dog. That's where my master chains me up. You get used to it. In that case, said the wolf, goodbye, cousin. I'd rather starve while I'm free than be well fed in chains. Now, a lot of you, depending on your age, might have seen the movie Black Panther, and you'll recognize that exact same line from the movie Black Panther. Aesop's fables are everywhere in culture. It starts as soon as we start looking for them. But when Aesop finished speaking, his master fell silent. He thought for a long time, and then he granted Aesop's wish. For the first time in his life, Aesop was free. And this is the moment where I wish we could be talking with Pamela right now, because this is one of my favorite pages of any book I've ever written. You can see what she's done flowing out behind the bird as Aesop is freed on its shoulders are all of the morals and all of the titles of the stories that he's told flowing out behind him like the air that the bird's wings rise on. Soon, everyone had heard about the slave who was so wise he had been set free. They went to him for help and advice. Aesop's stories were so memorable that they were told and retold in the streets. As the years went by, the masters grew old and passed away. And their wealth and lands were lost, their names just forgotten. Aesop, too, eventually passed away, as we all do, but his fame kept growing. His stories were repeated in homes and town squares for generations, for centuries. Now, it's worth, if you have a moment, just pause right here and you can see. Look at this illustration that Pamela's made. Look at the people telling stories on the right-hand side, all the way down from house to house. Look at all the animals in each story talking to each other and how they flow in and out of each other. I just This is an amazing piece of work. Until one day, someone gathered them in together in a book and called them Aesop's Fables. It became one of the most popular books in history. And this book was actually created where they, all the stories were put together along the life of Aesop in the first century BC. Um, and interestingly enough, it was put together by a man named Phaedrus, and he dedicated to the book to the most fa famous gladiator in Rome at the time. So in a way, Aesop's fables were collected as a story for a gladiator, a man who was enslaved himself, but who was powerful, but his power had limits as well. And you can see, again, there's no end to the amount of details that Pamela put in here. You can see young Aesop through the window behind looking out, looking through into the story. And the writer right there and all the stories surrounding the page as the stories are written down. And in the pages of this book, Aesop, the boy who was born a slave, who told stories to escape, traveled further than any king and lived longer than any empire. He traveled across languages, countries, and continents. He traveled across 2,500 years of time to be here today. And now that you've heard his stories, he can travel for a while with you. And that's the end. Now, there's not too much more I can say about this. Um, I think, personally, I think there's a reason this story has lasted so long. This is one of the oldest stories in human existence. It has lasted longer than almost any other to story told by humankind. Um, and I, that's because I think it's just a, a gorgeous story. It's a story about stories helping us be free. Uh, and as you're here today, uh, watching the Bay Area Book Festival and hearing stories from all the authors um, telling you about their lives and their stories and sharing their stories with you, I hope you can take that and use that because we're all stuck inside right now. Um, and I hope. Every time you hear one of these stories or every time you take these stories and tell one yourself, you can try writing your own fables. They're easy to write. Um, hopefully that will be a way that you can be a little bit free as well. Um, thank you very much for listening to me, my book, The Fable Life of Aesop.
And I hope you have a lovely day. And I hope you manage to get outside a little bit, socially distance safe, um, and be well with your family. Bye. Mm -hmm.